Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nathan Nee, Associate Science Editor for The Scientist, and I will be moderating our discussion. Today, our speakers, Dr. Mary Phillip and Dr. Benjamin Youngblood, will discuss how T-cell exhaustion is defined, its causes and drivers, and how it affects cell and immune-based therapies. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and Drs. Philip and Youngblood will address these questions during the Q&A session that follows both presentations. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A tab and type your query into the question box located on the right side of your screen. This webinar will be archived on the Scientist's website, and we will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. At this moment, I'd like to take an opportunity to thank our webinar sponsors, Canopy Biosciences, ETCC, Selectica, Acrobiosystems, Adipogen Life Sciences, and BD Biosciences. Our sponsors have provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar topic, and we have posted these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. With that, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Mary Phillip is an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in the Departments of Medicine, Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Pathology, sorry, Depart Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology. Philip received her Bachelor of Science degree in Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry from Yale University and her MD PhD from the University of Chicago. She completed her internal medicine residency training at the University of Chicago before going to the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, University of Washington for Hematology Oncology Fellowship training. Here, she developed clinical expertise in hematologic malignancies and lymphoma. Philip then joined Andrea Scheitinger's group at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as a senior research scientist to decipher the epigenetic regulation of tumor-specific T-cell dysfunction in cancer. Philip's research group at Vanderbilt aims to understand how transcription factor-driven chromatin epigenetic remodeling regulates CD8 T-cell differentiation in cancer, infection, and autoimmunity. As a physician, physician scientist, Philip's goal is to use clinically relevant mouse models of cancer to dissect the molecular mechanisms underlying T-cell function and dysfunction and to design novel strategies to transform tumor-specific T-cells into potent anti-tumor agents. Let's make sure everything's up and running from a technical standpoint. Everything looks good on this end. Dr. Philip, the floor is yours. Please take it away. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to thank the th scientists for giving me this opportunity to talk about T-cell dysfunction and reprogrammability in cancer. Let's see. Uh, just to start with a brief outline of what I was uh, planning to cover today, just wanted to give you an overview about uh, how T cells respond to cancer, to discuss how CD8 T cell dys dysfunction develops during tumor agenesis, how dysfunction is molecularly encoded in T cells, um, including um, some of the key transcription factors and a little bit about the epigenetic regulation, to talk about dysfunctional or exhaustive T cell differentiation hierarchies, and finally to, to talk about what population of CD8 T cells mediate immune checkpoint blockade responses. Um, so much of our understanding of T cell dysfunction exhaustion has come not only from the study of tumors, but also during chronic viral infection. Um, and I, I think Ben will probably talk maybe more about the chronic viral infection, but we've done a lot of our work in the tumor setting, so I'm really going to focus on T cell dysfunction in tumors. So when we think about T cell responses to self and non-self uh, tumor antigens, we, you know, we can kind of put the, the, all the antigens that are seen into these two big categories. And, you know, a lot of the initial thoughts about why um, T cells fail, you know, T cells or the immune system didn't control uh, cancers in patients was really functional, whether antigens were even present that could be recognized. So uh, the first category of 
T cell antigens are self antigens, and T cells develop within the thymus. And here, they're educated to um, to be trained to be able to recognize peptides on the context of MHC. So CD8 T cells recognize peptide antigens that are derived from intracellular proteins presented on class one, and then the T cells can see them. Uh, class two uh, CD4 T cells, which I I won't be talking about, see antigen on uh, MHC class two. But T cells that can recognize self antigen with the thymus should undergo a process of central uh, uh, tolerance where they are deleted. However, some self-reactive uh, T cells will manage to escape the central tolerance and go out into the periphery. And so, so self-reactive T cells that actually can see antigens within the periphery will undergo this process of peripheral self-tolerance. And uh, this is a process where they'll either be rendered um, non-responsive or even deleted in the periphery. And this is really important in order to prevent autoimmunity. Um, however, this type of peripheral T cell tolerance can be an obstacle for cancer immunotherapy if we're trying to, uh, for example, target uh, oncogenes that are overexpressed in cancer, then this peripheral tolerance can prevent effective T cell responses against those antigens. On the other side are tumor-specific neoantigens. So these are uh, proteins within cancer cells that are derived from uh, mutated proteins, or they could be uh, oncogenic viral proteins. And since these uh, epitopes have not been seen by the immune system before within the thymus, they should really be recognized as foreign antigens. And we, we might predict that the immune response or the T cell response to these would be a strong response that would recognize these uh, cells and eliminate them. However, we've known for many years, and this was first described by Ingegerd and Carl Hallstrom uh, back in 1968 with this really important paper, where they found that T cells specific for human uh, tumor cells, while they could eliminate or kill these cells in vitro within the, the patient, they were clearly just coexisting peacefully. And this has been uh, since then called or known as the Hallstrom paradox. And what it suggests is that these tumor specific T cells are in fact dysfunctional. So that leads to the question, when does T cell dysfunction develop within solid tumors? And really a lot of the uh, effort to understand this has focused on elements within the tumor marker environment. So when we look at um, these late stage solid uh, tumors that oftentimes are the types of tumors we're hoping to treat with immunotherapy in patients, there are many factors, uh, both cellular factors, uh, soluble factors, as well as physiologic factors about the tumors, which can all contribute to uh, causing an immunosuppressive uh, microenvironment. That being said, we know from the work of many um, cancer biologists over the years that uh, cancer initiation is really this process that is occurring in a stepwise fashion and can take many, many years in patients. And it really starts when within a normal uh, cell uh, a single cell can, can develop a mutation. This is known as cancer initiation. And once this mutation occurs uh, with this, the second state of tumorogenesis or promotion, these cells proliferate, they acquire more and more mutations and over time accumulate gradually developing this um, microenvironment, all the stromal cells and things necessary to maintain the tumor uh, till we get to this late stage tumor with all the hallmarks that we think of that are immunosuppressive. That being said, um, these uh, mu mutations can occur anywhere along this pathway. So that means that T cells could potentially be recognizing um, mutated antigens even as early as the uh, initiation phase. And so we really were interested in this question, what is the fate of T cells that encounter, um, that encounter these neoantigens very early during tumorogenesis? So this is a difficult question to answer in humans because oftentimes by the time patients present, they really come in with these late stage tumors. So we developed this mouse model um, and it's a mouse model of liver cancer to allow us to study CD8 T cell responses. Um, so we are using uh, this mouse called the AST mouse, which was developed by Natalio Garbi's group in which the SV40 large T antigen, so this is a viral oncogene, it serves as the oncogenic driver. Um, it also has several T cell epitopes, so it can also be the target or a tumor specific antigen. So this antigen is not expressed unless we first excise this uh, stop cassette. So this is an inducible model. So by crossing the AST mouse to a Cree strain, and here we're using a tamoxifen inducible Cree, we generate this mouse in which with the uh, treatment of, uh, of tamoxifen, we can basically start tumorogenesis um, uh, going forward. 
So here you can see that uh, without tamoxifen, the liver looks fairly normal, uh, normal uh, hepatocytes. And then within 10 to 30 days after a single dose of tamoxifen is given to induce the tag protein, you start to see these pre-malignant lesions developing. And then if you uh, allow these mice to continue to progress by about three to four months, they will develop pathologically defined hepatocellular carcinoma. So fairly late stage tumors, at which point we have to euthanize these animals. So in addition to the tumor model, we also can make use of this very nice um, TCR transgenic mouse where all of the T cells are specific for one epitope within this uh, protein. Um, so these are our TCR tag transgenic mice. So we use a workflow um, that's pretty common in immunology, the adoptive transfer uh, technique, where we take a small number of, of tag-specific T cells from these donor mice. Uh, these are marked with a surface marker so we can track them in their new host. So we transfer them into black six wild type mice, for example. And if we give these mice one day later a listeria or bacteria that, if, that expresses this specific epitope that the T cells can recognize, we can then look at, okay, how do these T cells recognize or respond to a bacterially encoded antigen? So when we isolate, re-isolate these T cells from these infected mice at day seven or day 60, we can then stim them and see, are they functional or not? So a naive T cell that's never seen antigen can make uh, the cytokine TNF, but it does not make much interferon gamma. Um, by the time they become effector T cells at day seven, you can see that they now really uh, highly produce both TNF, alpha, and interferon gamma. So this is a hallmark of effector uh, T cells, highly cytolytic. And they also make other cytotoxic molecules, including branzyme um, B perforin. And then if you look at a memory time point, so 60 days after infection and, and re-stim, they also are, are very highly functional T cells. So this just is to show you that these tag-specific T cells in the right context can become highly functional. So then what we did was to do exactly the same experiment, but now we're transferring these T cells into our tumor model. Uh, so we put them in on day zero and then induce one day later with tamoxifen that starts tumorigenesis in the liver. And then we can now take T cells out of, at multiple time points and say, what, how do they look? What's their differentiation status and how functional are they? And so what we found to our surprise is that very quickly, so this is just uh, naive T cells and then at different time points, five, seven, 14, and 28 days after uh, TAM in injection, these mice, uh, the T cells rapidly get into the liver where they're really uh, activated, upregulating CD44. They uh, progressively downregulate CD62 all over time. However, they also quickly upregulate uh, PD-1 to a pretty high level and LAG-3 as well as many other um, inhibitory receptors. So these are hallmarks of what we call T-cell dysfunction. And then when we look at their effector cytokine production, we were even more surprised to see that within five days, these T-cells essentially are unable to make not even TNF-alpha, but they also just are not able to make any interferon gamma also. And this really persists throughout the uh, lifetime of these, um, of these animals. So we then asked, okay, well, is this a stable state? Can we rescue these T cells in any way? And in order, order to do that, we took them out of the mice at different time points and cultured them in vitro with IL-15. So take, take them out of the tumor, see, can we make them functional again? And it turns out if you take them out at an early time point, they again regain the ability to make it effector cytokines. So we say these are rescued T cells. But once we waited to 12 days or beyond in uh, the original host, after reculturing them in vitro, we were unable to rescue them. And we tried several other different uh, methods to rescue. And in all of these cases, these T cells just remain incapable of making effector cytokine as shown here. So that really led us to characterize. Um, so basically, essentially early T cells, yes, you can reprogram them. After day 14 or so, no, they cannot be reprogrammed. And we call these two different dysfunctional states a plastic dysfunctional state, meaning we can reprogram it, or a fixed dysfunctional state in which basically even taking them out of the context of the tumor, they remain dysfunctional. So that led us to ask, well, is this cancer-induced CD8 T cell dysfunction, is this somehow epigenetically imprinted, given that it persists even when we transfer them to a new host? So in order to test this, we basically did these same adoptive transfer experiments, putting T cells into an infected mouse and looking at functional um, states, uh, effector and memory, or into our tumor model and looking at these functional T cells at various time points. 
And we re-isolated the T cells and, and then uh, subjected them to two different types of analyses, RNA-seq to look at their chromatin, uh, sorry, to look at their transcriptional activity or their mRNA production. And then we used a technique ATAC-seq to look at chromatin accessibility. So when we talk about epigenetic regulation, epigenetic regulation is really everything above the level of DNA sequence that could potentially control gene expression. And this includes many, many different facets, including DNA methylation, histone modifications, and others. But ATEC-seq really just looks at one particular uh, facet of epigenetic regulation, which is how accessible is the chromatin? Is it tightly compacted and wrapped in histones? Or is it uh, kind of in a more open configuration where it would be um, able to bind transcription factors, um, RNA polymerase, and get transcribed. And so ATEC-seq, by inserting these, uh, or the TN5 transposase is used to insert uh, primers, which it, they'll go into accessible regions of chromatin. And then we can read out by sequencing which parts of the whole genome are actually accessible to the transposase and which are relatively closed. So when we, we characterize these chromatin states or the chromatin accessibility, what we found is that there are these discrete states that seem to be associated with the different states of dysfunction we observed. And so this is one way to visualize that, where we just look at the number of peaks that open and close at every time point. And what you can see is that uh, when you, a naive T cell is initially activated in the tumors, they undergo pretty large scale chromatin remodeling. However, over time, this isn't a kind of continuous process of, you know, continuing to add or remove um, peaks. You really see a, a large wave of chromatin remodeling early on, a second wave between day seven and 14. And then after that, very little changes. So this seems to happen in a kind of um, waves or stepwise fashion. This is another way to look at that same data. These are just heat maps showing um, every line is a, is a specific peak. And if it's blue, it's closed. If it's red, it's open. And hopefully we, what you can see is that the naive T cells have a very different pattern of chromatin accessibility as compared to these early dysfunctional or late dysfunctional T cells. And in fact, this time temporally, these different states really correspond to what I uh, showed you earlier, where these earlier T cells are the ones that are capable of being reprogrammed. Whereas after day 14 or beyond, we really have a hard time getting these T cells to become functional again. So we really think these different chromatin accessibility states are encoding or associated associated with these distinct ability to be reprogrammed. And finally, this is just a, a final way to look at this, which is just a principal components analysis to say how similar or different are the T cells in these different buckets. And what you see is that the naive T cells, effector and memory kind of cluster fairly closely together, but these are very distinct. So, so early effectors within, a, within an infection are quite distinct from early activated T cells within uh, these pre-malignant lesions, which are in turn, again, very different from the later dysfunctional T cells. So we next wanted to, to get some sense of what transcription factors are really driving these different transitions. So the transition to this early state and the late state. And to do that, we looked at uh, transcription factor motifs and what motifs are enriched within peaks that are opening and closing. And so when we look at the early transition to this early dysfunctional state, what we find is that there are a lot of peaks opening that are highly associated with NFAT um, transcription factor family members. And these peaks and motifs are actually uh, associated with genes that we know uh, are associated with dysfunction, including PD-1 and LAG3, as well as others. When we look at the later transition from day seven to 14, so this is our plastic to fix this functional transition, what we actually see is that are, there are a lot of peaks closing. And interestingly, the peaks that are closing are associated with TCF family members. Um, and when we look at TCF1 expression, um, we see that it's quite high in naive T cells. In our early dysfunctional T cells, it gets downregulated and then further uh, uh, shut down or basically going to uh, a negative state in these later dysfunctional T cells. Um, so it suggests that these two transcription factors, NFAT and TCF1, may be associated with each of these transitions. And so in order to test that, we took a pharmacologic strategy where we um, uh, first use uh, the, the drug FK506, so this is an immunosuppressant and a calcineurin inhibitor, which can be, uh, which is used in patients after transplant, for example, to as an immunosuppressive drug. But we use it here at a, at a lower than therapeutic dose in order to partly downregulate um, NFAT activity without shutting it down completely. 
And then in order to, to turn on TCF1, we use TWS119, which is a GSK3 beta inhibitor. So this would, um, by stabilizing beta catenin, lead to increases in TCF1. So we set up this follow this experiment. We, we set up a cohort of uh, mice that had received the TCR tag, started tamoxifen, and one group got controlled. Our next group got uh, FK506 starting from a pretty early time point because we know that, F, that NFAT seems to be an early actor in this process. And then to try to prevent sort of the later dysfunction, we combined the FK506 with our TWS119. And um, we did basically an ex vivo analysis immediately at, at day 10. And then we also did a three day uh, in vitro rescue experiment just to see uh, what these look like after removal from the tumor. And so what we find is that yes, with, with the, these two drugs, we are still able to get T cell activation in the tumors um, uh, very comparably across all three. But interestingly, we see this nice decrease in PD-1 with uh, either NFAT inhibition alone or with NFAT plus induction of TCF1. Uh, a similar story with LAG3. And then in contrast, we see that TCF1 actually is progressively higher in the FK506 single or the dual FK506 TW119 um, treated group. However, in spite of looking phenotypically maybe slightly better, they remain profoundly dysfunctional ex, ex vivo. So none of these cells are making any cytokine. But what was interesting is that after three days of in vitro culture, you actually are better able to rescue um, function in these FK506 or dual treated T cells as compared to the control. So uh, basically we're not able to prevent this effector function loss. However, we're kind of delaying the transition from the plastic to the fixed dysfunctional state. Um, so kind of suggests that overall this approach of the, or that, you know, our identification of transcription factors, we are finding things that are in fact important for T cell dysfunction, but clearly not the entire story. So everything I showed you so far is in, uh, in uh, mice. So what about in patients? So here we uh, isolated PD-1 high T cells from human tumors and we, sh and we looked at their chromatin accessibility. And we in fact found that when you look at the overlap with um, our T cells from the mouse liver, the human PD-1 high cells have the highest overlap with our late stage um, hepatic tumor uh, T cells. And in fact, if we look at, for example, TCF7, which encodes TCF1, we see similar um, uh, peak changes within both the human and mouse uh, T cells in sh these shared uh, conserved uh, sequences. So it does suggest that what we are saying that these patterns of T cell differentiation are not specific to a particular tumor type or mouse. Um, it's really something that seems to be conserved across species and tumor types. So that kind of leads us to be, to be able to put together this model where, uh, you know, putting T cells onto this familiar Waddington landscape, they start off in a naive state and during acute infection, for example, they will um, kind of go downhill to an effector state or to a memory state. Um, however, when you're in a tumor, you initially progress as uh, to a, this plastic T cell, plastic dysfunctional state, and then later to a fixed dysfunctional state. Um, and what, you know, we're really interested in trying to do is to figure out, okay, are there T cells that can help, or transcription factors that can help us to reverse um, these uh, plastic dysfunctionals to the effector? Um, you know, NFAT and TCF1 are clearly uh, transcription factors that control some of these um, features, but, you know, not the entire story. Um, so we next, you know, went on to look at our data again and say, okay, can we find transcription factors that are really unique to dysfunctional tumor-specific T cells? And this is work that was uh, really led by Andrew Slott, a grad student in Andrea's lab who has since graduated. Um, and basically what we did was to look at the RNA-seq data. We identified this um, gene TOX, which is encodes an HMG DNA binding protein, and is highly upregulated in tumor dysfunctional T cells and not in other subsets. And this is confirmed here by protein. And we looked in um, TILs from breast cancer, from lung cancer, and from patients with uh, melanoma. And when we look at this PD-1 high CD39 uh, positive T cells, you can see that uniformly across the board, they upregulate TOC. So it really suggests that this is somehow associated with um, dysfunction. So we were able to get tox efficient uh, mice from Jonathan Kay, who initially made these mice. And what we did was to take 
uh, T cells in which the tox was either wild type or deleted just in CD8 T cells or uh, mature T cells, transfer them into our tumor bearing mice and then look at how they differentiate. So first of all, you could see it within a week after being in the tumor, you, we can isolate pretty similar numbers then knock out our, our low for toxins we would uh, expect. They do activate similarly and they're proliferating very similarly. Interestingly though, the, the knockout, you, we really lose expression of the inhibitory receptors across the board. So tox does uh, seem to be behaving as expected. It's really regulating expression of a, a lot of these inhibitory receptors we associate with this function. So we were very disappointed when we looked at our effector cytokine function and find that our tox knockout T cells are pretty much as dysfunctional as just a wild type. So making no interferon gamma uh, and then uh, no cytolytic function. So it really shows that even with this very little or no expression of inhibitory receptors, tumor specific T cells re remain very profoundly dysfunctional. I think this is an important point that um, we'll come back to later that, you know, the immunophenotype does not necessarily equate with the effector function um, and seem to be regulated independently. Um, so what, you know, another thing that we can do with this information is to say, okay, well, we know that these different chromatin states can define plastic and fixed T cells, but, you know, we can't use uh, epigenetic analysis in, in, to find these T cells in patients. So what we did was to look for markers. So PD-1 and LAG-3 or other inhibitory receptors are used to identify dysfunctional T cells, but they're pretty similar between our plastic and fixed dysfunctional T cells. So we profiled and looked for other membrane proteins that potentially could distinguish what are early plastic dysfunctional T cells from later dysfunctional T cells. And we identified several of them. These are just some of the examples of CD38, CD101, and CD30L, which are all upregulated or CD5, which is really downregulated when you go from this plastic uh, dysfunctional state to the fixed state. And so how you can use this information is that if we take T cells, so this is uh, kind of a intermediate or the, an intermediate time point where the bulk of these T cells, if you try to rescue, can't rescue. But if you now drill down and just sort based on CD38101 low or high, so you see that there's heterogeneity at this time point, these high T cells are not rescuable, whereas the CD38, CD101 low T cells, in fact, can be rescued with our in vitro rescue assay. Um, and so this is in the mouse liver model. And then in collaboration with Dr. Alex Snyder, we were able to look at human, human ovarian uh, tumors. And if you look at the PD1 high T cells and now sort based on 38 and 101, again, you can see a similar pattern that these, uh, that, fun that phenotypically look more plastic are in fact more able to regain function, whereas the late or plastic or fixed uh, looking uh, T cells are in fact uh, dysfunctional. So potentially this, this could be a way or a tool to try to identify uh, within patients, what are T cells, do they have T cells for soul that can be rescued and where, where are they? So uh, I want to kind of circle back to something that uh, we started with, which is the question of what is really driving T cell dysfunction in tumors. Um, you know, there, there are several uh, kind of competing factors. One is that, that we have chronic antigen, which, as we know from all the studies in chronic viral infection, is clearly something um, that drives exhaustion dysfunction in T cells. There's also this immunosuppressive microenvironment, and both could be contributing or, or one or the, or the other. So to test this, we did this experiment where we took our tumor-specific T cells and we co-transferred them together with kind of a bystander T cell. So these are uh, OT1 or OVA-specific T cells. Um, we put both of these T cells into our uh, tumor-bearing mice. And here we use really late stage uh, tumor-bearing mice because we really wanna look at what the impact of the microenvironment is. A day after the transfer, we give these mice listeria expressing both of the epitopes because we want to activate both of the T cells, otherwise the OVA T cells won't be activated. So we co-activate both of them and then analyze uh, over time and see what happens to these T cells. This is the control just to show you that if you transfer these T cells into just a wild type black six mouse and give them listeria, they will all both activate equally. Uh, they start to downregulate CD62 and they have very similar levels of all of our inhibitory receptors. But when we do the same thing in a tumor bearing mouse, it's really quite striking that within, so these are all isolated from the liver tumors. 
while our tag-specific T cells are highly upregulated in PD-1, our over-specific T cells do not. Um, and the same, same is true for all the other inhibitory receptors. And then when we look at function, so because of the Listeria immunization, we are able to get some function in both the tumor-specific as well as the bystander over-specific T cells. But then pretty quickly over time, you see that the tumor-specific T cells lose their function um, completely, while the over-specific T cells within the same tumor remain functional, have a, kind of like a memory-like um, uh, phenotype, both phenotype and functional readout. So what this tells us is that really the, the antigen is the primary driver of T cell dysfunction. And this is not to say that, um, you know, we don't think the microenvironment can contribute. It clearly does. But what it does show you is that the microenvironment is not able on its own to cause this function. You really have to have this antigen stimulation that's chronic in addition. And just as another example from patients, if you, this is uh, a tumor from a patient with melanoma where we were able to use tetramers to look at either CMV specific T cells, so memory T cells within the tumor versus um, uh, these are melanoma antigen tetramer stained T cells. And you can see that while the, the tumor specific T cells again are highly PD-1 uh, expressing, the uh, viral specific bystander T cells do not. So again, um, it's really uh, not the microenvironment alone that drives this function, but antigen stimulation. Um, so, you know, the, uh, what we can start to think about kind of the picture of what does our differentiation hierarchy of T cells look like um, and kind of compare a little bit what we see or what has been observed in chronic infection versus in tumors. Well, we think is that at the late time points, both uh, in, within a tumor as well as in, within chronic viral infection, they look pretty similar. They have high levels of tox and low levels of TCF1. But how they get there might be a little bit different. So in chronic viral infection, um, researchers have really built up this nice picture where an effector-like T cell that um, maybe has some effector function initially will uh, differentiate into this progenitor stem-like T cell where they express TCF1 and tox. These T cells can self renew, but they also can give rise to more terminally differentiated um, exhausted cells. These are tox high, TCF1 low, and have more, um, uh, more cytolytic function than the progenitors. Um, so this is kind of this branch differentiation model. What I showed you so far in the tumors could be described maybe more as a linear differentiation model, where we see that the T cells that get into the tumor, they are in this sort of early dysfunctional state, which is TCF1 high um, and tox expressing, but with continued antigen, they really all become these tox high TCF1 low uh, T cells. So not, not quite this branch differentiation model that's been described in chronic infection. However, um, we, you know, most of what I showed you was all from within the tumor. And there is still definitely the possibility that this type of branch differentiation also happens perhaps within tertiary, tertiary lymphoid structures or within uh, draining lymph nodes. So, <clears throat> so that kind of leads to this question. Um, you know, we showed that only the really early TCF1 high T cells uh, that we found within the, within the tumor could be rescued. But when we looked at TIL um, or tumor infiltrating T cells from uh, patients with cancers, most, most or all of these T cells were these kind of TCF1 negative, really terminally dysfunctional looking T cells. And if that's the case, how, how do we even have any patients that are able to respond to checkpoint, immune checkpoint blockade? Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the work that's been done um, in human uh, using pa patient samples uh, with cancer that have really kind of looked at this question. Um, and I think one of the um, one, one of the challenges in patients is that we don't know the tumor specificities. Um, you know, we have that luxury in the mouse model. We know exactly what our uh, T cells are recognizing. However, in patients, um, you know, you don't know that a priori. Um, however, with the advent of single cell and TCR seq, that's been something that people have been uh, able to address. So uh, Nirha Conan's group used single cell RNA seq looking at tumor and peripheral blood, and they showed that actually TCF1 positive subsets of T cells were associated with a better response to checkpoint. And then subsequently, the um, uh, Ido Amit group and Howard Chang's group showed that if you look at patients before and after uh, checkpoint, it seems like you're really recruiting a new subset um, or this kind of clonal replacement where TCF1 positive CDA T cells from the periphery are really what get recruited into the tumor and expand in response to checkpoint. Um, 
a nice paper from the Kissick group um, showed that, that you can find T cell on stem like T cells. And they're found within these, uh, interestingly, within these intratumoral niches, and this is in human kidney cancer, which happen to contain uh, antigen presenting cells. And I finally want to highlight a paper that came out last year from uh, Rafi Ahmed's group, where uh, this was an example where they were actually able to show tumor specificity because they focused on HPV positive uh, head and neck cancers. And here they can use tetramers against HPV antigens to look at really specific tumor specific T cells. And they found that there is a stem like TCF1 positive T cell that are within these stromal tumor free niches within the tumor. And they were able to also show that when you stimulate these T cells, they kind of differentiate in the same pattern of TCF1 high to TCF1 low and other features that have been shown in the mouse models and chronic viral infection. So taken together, I think it does suggest that the, the observations that uh, we and others have made um, to look at these differentiation hierarchies um, really do hold up in patients. And so this is kind of a model, um, you know, trying to put everything together where you know, perhaps in patients within the tumor, uh, there may be these specialized niches in which you can have TCF1 high more stem-like uh, T cells or from secondary lymphoid organs or the peripheral blood. Um, and these are all potentially T cells that can respond to immunotherapy, whereas our late dysfunctional tumors, T cells within the tumors are really not able to respond to um, therapy. Um, so just to summarize, this is uh, kind of the picture that we have of what TDA T cell differentiation looks like during uh, tumor genesis. Um, again, you know, you have an oncogenic hit gradually developing um, over time to a late stage uh, solid tumor. And T cells potentially may be able to see antigens even at these very early time points. Um, that being said, there's also something known as uh, immunologic ignorance, which perhaps these um, initial um, mutated cells may not be seen by the immune system if not enough antigen goes to um, uh, tumor draining lymph nodes or to be where it can be uh, presented or T cells fail to infiltrate within these premolecular lesions. However, at some point, we think that T cells that are specific for these antigens do in fact see um, antigen, whether that's in draining lymph nodes or within the tumor itself. And because of suboptimal primary priming, or perhaps because there's not the uh, acute in, innate or inflammatory signals we see during infection, these T cells don't really become functional. They really rapidly go into this hypofunctional state. Um, and then with continued antigen exposure as these tumors grow, they go from this phase, early phase where they're uh, perhaps more energic or early dysfunctional in this early dysfunctional state to a progressively more and more um, you know, fixed dysfunctional state um, where uh, they are really are difficult to rescue with uh, checkpoints. Um, giving you uh, some of our data showing, uh, so this is what I just said, we think that chronic TCR stimulation is really the key driver of this and the microenvironment also plays a role obviously because the ligands that these, uh, uh, the PD-1 and other inhibitory receptors that these cells uh, express, they do engage with uh, ligands in the microenvironment that are induced by um, you know, features of tumors. We think that transcription factors such as NFAT and TOX are really major drivers of and regulators of dysfunction, but that the functional responses or the ability to be reprogrammed um, or rescued really is um, in part at least uh, mediated by TCF1. And that the, that the T cells are really mediate rescue may be found within secondary lymphoid uh, organs or tertiary lymphoid structures. Um, and so with that, I just want to uh, acknowledge, uh, first of all, um, Andrea uh, Schiedinger, and whose lab most of this work was done and has been really a fantastic uh, collaborator and um, uh, kind of fellow worker in the tumor immunology field and uh, excited to be continuing to work with her uh, and all the members of her lab. Uh, bioinformatics work from Dr. Christina Leslie at MSK um, as well, and her group, as well as um, Dr. Duran Vettel and his group at Cornell. Um, to all the people in my lab who are continuing to build on these um, exciting findings and really do deep mechanistic dives into kind of what makes CDAT cells tick in all these different environments. And then finally, to all the funding that's helped to support this work. And with that, um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Philip. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will try to address as many of your questions as possible after our next speaker. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Benjamin Youngblood. Benjamin Youngblood is currently an associate member in the Department of Immunology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. In 2001, he received a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from Oregon State University and went on to do his graduate training in biochemistry studying enzyme specificity of DNA methyltransferases at the University of California, Santa Barbara. In 2007, he joined Rafi Ahmed's laboratory for postdoctoral training, focusing on the epigenetic regulation of memory CD8 T cell differentiation. In 2014, he joined the faculty at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and has developed a research program focused on the epigenetic mechanisms involved in the development of functional and non-functional CD8 T cells, as well as translating novel discoveries into therapies that treat chronic viral infection, cancer, and autoimmunity. Everything looks good from a technical standpoint. Dr. Youngblood, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction and, and the, the generous uh, invitation to uh, provide a seminar on T-cell exhaustion. Uh, and thank you to Mary for the wonderful setup. I, I, while I was listening to Mary, I actually deleted some of my slides just because she gave such a beautiful background on T-cell differentiation. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've done, give a general setup for where I think that what, what I think the challenges are in terms of translating basic discovery and in the hurdles we have in understanding T-cell exhaustion into uh, advancing therapies or novel therapies. Um, and so these are just some of the disclosures I have. So get, Mary gave a beautiful background on how T cells see antigen, whether it be self or a foreign antigen. And when these T cell sees a foreign antigen, this is what happens. It sees it from this antigen presenting cell and it initiates this clonal expansion. These cells can, under the proper conditions, can expand massively numerically. They can expand upwards of 100,000 fold in their number. And while they're undergoing this expansion, they're going, undergoing changes in their differentiation state. They acquire these abilities to express various effector cytokines and Mary very nicely showed you. And they acquire this ability to directly kill the antigen presenting cell. So speaking in two very broad terms, uh, one thing that can happen here is the source of the antigen is clear. This is what happens during acute infection or vaccination, and you can be left with a, a smaller subset of cells that go on to become these long-lived functional memory T cells. This is what we all tr strive to achieve um, in our various vaccine vaccination models, and this is what happens during many acute infections. And in fact, sometimes this happens when you control a tumor. Uh, these functional memory T cells are very special. They have this capacity to undergo this antigen independent homeostatic self renewal. So they sit there in our body, at, at, in our lymphoid tissues, and at the source of antigen, and they can undergo the self renewal and they can persist in a quiescent state for decades in humans. And so what they're doing is they're waiting for maybe a re emergence of a tumor or a re exposure to that infection. And when they do see that antigen again, they rapidly recall that effector response. So now they're poised to recall that, that, that killing capacity, the homing capacity to the site of the antigen, and hopefully very quickly can recontrol that much faster than they did in that initial primary response. So that's under optimal conditions. What happens during a chronic infection or during tumor is that you progressively suppress these effector functions. These effector functions are actually, can be immunopathogenic. So you can't sustain them for very long. So the system has evolved a way to turn this down, turn, turn that effective response, tune it down a little bit. And over time, it gets really shut down. And this is what Mary has termed, uh, described you as exhaustion. The field is generally calling this exhaustion. It's a, it's a progressive suppression of those effector functions. So this, as you might, and you're now well aware of, is that this is a problem for developing therapies to treat cancers. The T cells that we're working with, if they're an endogenous response in the tumor, have already been turned off. How do we reprogram those cells or how do we pick the right subset of cells that can respond to the tumor? This is also a problem for cellular therapies. You're trying to pick a cell, the right cell, to engineer, to put it back into the patient and target that tumor. So 
I think many of you know that there's been some great strides main, made in activating this immune system. Jim Allison discovered CTLA-4 and block eight of CTLA-4 sustained that effective response. And this is now ipilimumab, it's a, it's a immune checkpoint blockade. And Tosuko Honjo, Rafi Ahmed and others really discovered and elaborated on the mechanism of PD-1 blockade where it's another inhibitory receptor. And it turns out and it, it suppresses the immune response somewhere re- between this effector stage and exhaustion. And by b- blocking both of those, you can re-elaborate or elaborate further on that effector response and hopefully control the tumor. This, of course, uh, resulted in the Nobel Prize to both uh, Jim Allison and to Soko Honjo. So checkpoint block A was a huge breakthrough. And I'm just going to illustrate its real power here with this, this really nice progression-free survival curve that was published by Jed Wolchuk a while ago. These are patients that had metastatic melanoma, and, and really most of them were going to succumb to the disease. And so what Jim really, really introduced to us was CTLA-4 block A. This is ipilimumab block A. And what he showed us was that if you treat these patients with CTLA-4 blockade, some of them respond and they respond durably. So this is patients with progression-free survival out many, many years now. PD-1 blockade brought this progression-free survival up to about 30%. The combination blockade brought this up to about 40 to 60%, depending on the tumor. This is, this is fantastic, right? We're now engaging the immune response to treat and target tumors. Uh, a, a very similar approach that I just alluded to is but t- or a, a different approach, but again, using T cells, our own T cells to treat tumors is CAR T cell therapy. And this is an approach where you take the T cells out of the patient, you engineer them with a receptor that targets the tumor, and then you re-infuse them now back into the patient. And now there, these patients, uh, given in, in, in the right circumstances with the right tumor, this is, this is BLL, this is CD19 CAR T cells, so T cells targeting that particular antigen. They can have a pretty good survival, although it wanes over time. And this is where the field is at. We want to know why there are patients out there for both checkpoint blockade and CAR T cell therapy, why there are people that don't respond to this therapy, and why, in some cases, why this therapeutic efficacy wanes over time. That's the big question for the field. Okay, so we've been trying to understand the real basics of this basic T cell biology. How does the T cell remember? How does it lose its memory? How does it get reinforced to go down this dysfunctional state and why can't you walk it backwards? And I'm gonna illustrate very simply how we think about this and maybe a little too simple, but T cells are like any other cell. They can acquire, under, when they're undergoing a cell fate decision, they acquire these epigenetic programs illustrated here as a methylation of a CG palindrome. So you're, you're a memory T cell, you've acquired this methylation here, and you're undergo, going to undergo this homeostatic self or no, no antigen, just going to maintain. And so you have to divide, and the parental strand of DNA has this methylation mark, and the newly synthesized daughter strand does not. But there's a maintenance methyltransferase that follows the replication loci around, it identifies hemimethylated substrates, and it propagates that methyl mark to the newly synthesized daughter strand. That, in essence, is heritable epigenetic regulation. So you can acquire a trait and propagate it to your daughter cells. So we've taken that concept to try to understand how immunological memory can persist for decades in humans. And also, how do you go down this other path of exhaustion and get reinforced there? So this is the general question. How are long-lived gene expression programs maintained in these functional and exhausted CD8 T cells? And so for the sake of time, I've really kind of <laughs> probably uh, distilled this down to two simple, two, too simple of a simple concept. So, but I want you to remember this for the sake of the talk. This is what the field has really uncovered over the past couple of decades. Mouse and, hem- and human memory T cells can persist in a quiescent state, poised, and they maintain this poised state in part through the acquisition of these epigenetic programs. And in humans, what we've shown is that they can maintain this for decades. They can acquire an epigenetic program, and they can maintain that program for decades. Epigenetic programs are also causal in reinforcing the developmental state of T-cell exhaustion. Now, I'm going to walk, Mary did a really beautiful job of kind of just showing you the correlates of this, and I'm going to walk you through some of the work we did to show that it's, in fact, causal. And so here's just some of the data that, the, some of the, the data and the publications that led up to this observation. It was a really nice paper from Dietmar Zane's group, um, 
uh, a few years back where he showed and not not the epigenetics of it, but the phenotypic and the functional preservation of these T cells. When he he literally pulled T cells out that were dysfunctional, put them in a new animal, and they maintain this this exhausted phenotype. We showed uh, some of these epigenetic programs were preserved in these long lived chronically infected animals. Uh, Andrea, and this is this is Mary's beautiful paper here uh, that she published with Andrea and John Wary and Nick Haining. They had some really nice papers showing that there's epigenetic stability in these exhausted CD8 T cells. They acquire a unique epigenetic state. Um, and then, then as as Mary pointed out, several papers. This is our paper here discovered this, this transcriptional regulator talks that enforces this epigenetic state. And one of the important observations we, that we made and others I think followed up on was that actually these aren't just correlates, these are causal programs. And what we showed in this paper here was that de novo epigenetic programs, the acquisition of these new programs, reinforces this fate and it limits response to checkpoint blockade. And what I'm going to show you today is that this is a general concept it applies not just to checkpoint blockade, but it applies to CAR T cell therapy as well. So this is some of the initial experiment. These are some of the initial experiments that led to this general concept. We took wild type and these conditional knockout animals, these animals that would delete DNMT3A. This is a de novo methyl transferase. This is the enzyme that adds that new methyl group. So they would conditionally delete them and activate the CD8 T cells. And then we took this chronic, this model of chronic infection, LCMV clone 13 infection, and we infected both wild type and, and these conditional knockout animals. And now I, I like to point out at this point that this is the model that developed the concept of exhaustion. The term of exhaustion was coined from using LCMV. So this is the right model to use. So what we did was we infected these animals. We, we, we looked at their viral load, their T cell phenotype, and the function of those T cells over time. And so this is a, a really beautiful model because it's systemic, you get very high viral loads. And in, in, indeed in both the wild type and the conditional knockout animals, the virus went extremely high and this is just looking in the serum and it persisted at very high, light, high titers for, for long periods of time. But interestingly, when we compared the numbers of T cells, we saw a real big difference here. Of course, both the wild type and knockout T cells expanded. I told you they, they can do that. They underwent contraction but here's where the difference occurred. The wild type cells continued to undergo contraction, and this was a severe form of T cell exhaustion the way we set up the model, but the conditional knockout cells did not. They entered sort of this maintenance phase, at least numerically, this maintenance phase where they looked more like a memory T cell. So we asked, what happens when you re-stimulate these cells? And I'm gonna show you some fact spots. I know there's some people on this call that have not seen fact spots before. And so what this is, is this is a, this is a, a readout for protein expression on the cell. Uh, in this, we're looking at the antigen-specific cells. This is a marker for the antigen-specific cells, the log expression. So each dot is a cell. And these cells are expressing a lot of GP33, this, this marker for GP33. And these cells are expressing a lot of PD-1. Okay, so these are the wild-type mice. This is about the percentage of the antigen-specific T cells in the mice two months post-infection. The conditional knockout cells they had a lot more of these antigen specific PD-1 high cells, but all the cells are PD-1 high. So the dogma at the time said, this is an inhibitory receptor, they should be turned off. So what happens if you stimulate them with their cognate peptide? So Mary showed you that this, this chronic antigen stimulation turns the effector response off. These cells, the ones that lack the ability to acquire these de novo programs, are completely fine. They're completely intact in their effector response. So when we reported this, this showed the field that these epigenetic programs are not just correlates. They're in fact causal. They're restricting that effector potential. And what we, I don't have time to show you here is they're uh, restricting the developmental potential. So we, we moved on. We asked, well, what happens now? If they're very functional, are these cells able to respond to checkpoint blockade? So we took these mice, we chronically infected them, we waited for the wild type T cells to be fully exhausted about this time point here, and then we initiated checkpoint blockade. And so I'm just looking, showing you again a couple of different epitopes now for the LCMV response, this is GP33, 276, and then this one down here, watch this guy down here. This is the guy that gets really suppressed in LCMV infection. And so you can see when you do checkpoint blockade, anti pd one here, these guys respond pretty well, and this is what the field got pretty excited about in showing this, this reactivation of the cells. Watch what happens when the cells lack these epigenetic programs. Wow, 
they all expand. All the epitopes expand. And even and now if you even look at CD44 expression, these, this is sort of a, a readout for the polyclonal response. All the, these mice were naive, and now they're, they're all, the only things that are they've seen is LCMV. The whole thing just shifts over at the checkpoint blockade. All of these cells are able to respond to PD-1 blockade. Okay, so this set up a model for the field. So the delineating program here is an epigenetic program. The program that delineates for ICB responsiveness versus non-responsiveness, at least in the LCMV setting, is an epigenetic repressive state. So you block that, or if you erase that, you can allow these cells to elaborate on this effective response. So here's where the field was at, and here's where we were. We see these T cells, they expand numerically. Some of them are destined to die. Some of them have this, this uh, preserved fate or a developmental potential, and we call the ones that are very plastic, you know, roughly, it's, you know, there's a lot more heterogeneity here than I'm drawing, but they have this memory potential, we call them memory precursors. During an acute infection, they can go on to be these long-lived functional memory T cells. During a chronic infection, as Mary very nicely showed, that they can progress and they can change over time phenotypically and they become these fully exhausted T cells eventually. Our data and a lot of other data shows that from these basic and clinical studies, it's a stem-like population, probably residing somewhere here in this developmental path, that is coupled to the clinical efficacy of ICB and CAR T cell therapy. And actually, Mary gave you a really nice list of papers that have illustrated this at the end of her, her, her presentation there. And then what we showed was that blocking, by blocking these programs at an early stage, you keep the cells at the stem-like state, and now they're responsive to checkpoint blockade. Does this, this is in a mirroring model system. So the question now is, does this happen in, in human T cells? And how do you use this information to move the field forward? And so we worked with a lot of people in the field. We kind of came to, tried to come together to, to develop a, a, a universal definition for T cell exhaustion. And if you read this, this news, this viewpoint article, you might find it kind of, everybody's got a different point, a viewpoint. But the universal thing is epigenetics is a universal definition. So we took that concept and we moved forward. And this is some work now that was published in a, f a few years ago by Caitlin Zebley and Yiping, Z Yiping Fan and uh, Hassam Velzimet. And we sought to really just use our insights into epigenetics to define the human T cell differentiation atlas, this epigenetic landscape of human T cell differentiation. And so we used T cells from humans under various conditions. <coughs> we took healthy donors from St. Jude here, where they just had memory and naive T cells. We took individuals that had been chronically infected with HIV, where we have well-defined populations of a fully exhausted CD8 T cells. These are human. And then we took individuals that have these, these cells that never seem to get exhausted, but they see their chronic source of antigen for long periods of time. These are type 1 diabetics, and they're having this... Uh, this uh, this sustained effector response. And so we performed whole genome methylation profiling on all these cells. And then what Yiping was able to do was he used uh, these cells and he sort of set a developmental bounds. And, and this is, you know, we had, to, we had to move forward with some assumptions. We said naive is at one end and exhausted as a, at the other end. And then with that in mind, he took all of these data sets, he performed a machine learning uh, analysis and he defined the CPG sites across the human genome that can predict the relative developmental potential of the T cells. And he called this, or we call this, the human T cell multipotency index. And he's done something a little bit, a uh, little bit to make it a little more user friendly. He weighted these CPG sites and gave us a numerical score uh, between ranging between one and zero, where one, uh, the cumulative score of one results in a very multipotent cell a more naive like and zero is terminally differentiated. So now we have a readout based on our understanding or, or some of our insight into how T cells undergo differentiation. We've used this now to move it forward into humans and to define a predictive index for the T cell differentiation status. So how do we apply these insights and tools towards advancing human immunotherapy efforts? And then, and of course, this is a circle that comes back around and learn more about human T cell differentiation. So here's what I showed you. You block the programs early in the T cell differentiation response, you preserve their, their developmental capacity. So how do you do this in humans? And so we now have teamed up with our colleagues in the bone marrow, transla uh, transla uh, bone marrow transplant and cellular therapy department here at St. Jude 
to use their really elegant CAR T cell model systems to test these concepts in primary human T cells. So the CAR T cell, as many of you probably know, the CAR T cell uh, model goes like this. You take the T cells out of the patient, uh, you just expand them, and you're left with a range of, of T cells. It's a very heterogeneous population. You have a range of T cells ranging from t naive T cells to these more terminal cells, these effector cells, but they're very effector-like. Now you, you can transduce them with a receptor that targets the tumor antigen. You grow them up, you expand them, you put them back into the patient, and you really hope that those T cells find the tumor and kill it. So with, with Steve Gonschlock, uh, he's the chair of the bone marrow transplant department, Brooke Prenzing and Ghidra Krenschut, and Caitlin Zebley, who is, a, who is a student in my lab who is now faculty in BMT, uh, we moved forward um, with deleting DNMT3 and these primary T cells, these T cells used for CAR generating CAR T cells to ask in a chronic setting, does this truly preserve an effector response? And so Ghidra did these experiments and they're very beautiful experiments where she knocked out DNMT, human DNMT3 using CRISPR, in, and I'm gonna show you various CAR T cell models, but this is IL-13 receptor alpha two CAR T cells. And this is just a Western showing this really nice knockout. And what she did was she took these CAR T cells and cultured them with the tumor, the tumor expressing the cognitive antigen. And she didn't culture just for a week, she serially cultured them because she wanted to mimic that chronic stimulation. And this was really key. And I'm gonna show you why. Because if you're just measuring fold expansion, the knockout and the control CAR T cells look the same. The fold expansion is about the same one to two weeks in. You can't see really a difference. You got to keep pushing these cells. So three weeks in, now you start to see the, the knockout cells peter out. They're kind of declining in their ability to expand. And what I'm not showing you here is also their effector response is waning. I mean, the, not, the control is declining, but DNMT3 and knockout continue to go. And they continue to go so long as you give them antigen. If you take away antigen, they undergo normal contraction. So this is fantastic. This is really showing us that this concept we developed in a mirroring model system is applying to humans. You knock out this de novo programmer, the cells have a retained capacity to expand. It's not just with this IL-13 receptor alpha-2. We had to test this with HER2, primary HER2 with <coughs> CD28, the second generation car. I just showed you the IL-13 receptor alpha-2, FHA2. Um, these are individual donors. The red is, and these are the weeks on the, the x-axis. Excess. The cells continue to expand as so long as you show them antigen. We, the, the reviewers of this paper were very generous and asked us to do a lot of experiments. We had to swap out co stem domains. It didn't matter. It's about the T cells, guys. It's about blocking that epigenetic program in the T cells. And so this is the relative expansion potential. They continue to go unless you take antigen away. So that was an in vitro experiment. How efficacious could this be? So Brooke Prenzing did this really beautiful experiment where she took these NSG mice, she put in uh, LM7, this is an osteosarcoma tumor, uh, and you, she can track the tumor with this luciferase readout. And she didn't just put the T cells in a week later, a couple days later, she actually waited a month for the tumor to metastasize to the lung. And then she tried to treat with the CAR T cells. And I'm just showing you the readout for the tumor growth here on the right here. This is the imaging, or if the, this is the PBS, the untreated mice. Tumor takes over and kills the mice in about 48 days. The control, or maybe a little bit longer. The control, you can see it's actually looking very similar to the, the PBS treated now. And now when you have these T cells that are exhaustion, essentially exhaustion resistant, these DNMT3 and knockout CAR T cells, they control the tumor. It takes them a little bit of time, but they control the tumor. So this is just the survival curves for the lung metastasis data. You can see there's significant survival now. And actually, this is a, a nice little experiment down here. We didn't show significance in the survival, but what I want to point out is, is that when you treat these mice, this is a brain tumor model now. It's intracranial injection of the tumors, and then followed by intracranial injection of, of the CAR T cells. Now, it's a kind of a noisy model, but look at the slopes here of these tumors, the tumor growth. Once it takes off, it goes. Okay, so these guys took off a little bit later, but then they went and they shot right up. In the DNMT3A knockout treated car t uh, mice with the car knockout CAR T cells, they started to go, but then they sustained the tumor growth or controlled the tumor growth. Didn't clear it, but controlled it. And so when we took these mice down, <coughs> what we found was the, the sustained control was associated with a persistence of the DNMT3A knockout CAR T cells in these brain tumors. So we've generated CAR T cell now that can, that can persist 
during chronic stimulation. I mean, real chronic. This is 100 days out. Okay, so we obviously we do a lot of epigenetic profiling in my lab. I'm not going to show you all the plots. But what I do want to show you is that we took all of these epigenetic profiles. We, did, we sampled at various time points in these in vitro and these in vivo settings. We collected a lot of data. We defined the DNMT3A specific programs. And we cross-referenced it back with published clinical data. This is from Carl June's uh, CLL treated patient a data set where they took the CD19 CAR T cells, they made CD19 CAR T cells, and they infused them to patients. They defined who the, and they figured out who the responders and non-responders are. The important thing about this study was they generated gene expression profiles at the, the manufacturing stage. So we took our DNMT3A signatures, we cross-referenced them with the manufacturing data, and we were able to delineate, this is Carl's definition, not ours. We were able to delineate who would be a responder versus non-responder just based on this DNMT3A signature. So these programs are regulating the clinical outcome of these CAR T cells. Okay, so so we I I you know I I, I feel we've uncovered a really nice epigenetic biomarker of T cell differentiation, and we believe it can be used to predict clinical response. And so we wrote this little thought piece on this. Steve Gottschalk and, 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 and Caitlin Zebley and I wrote this thought piece on this, trying to use these epigenetic marks to figure out what would be the right differentiation state for infusing into patients. And if you did, if you have all these patients now, I'm representing them just as this multipotency index, this development, the zero to one uh, developmental axis, you can, if you get enough data, then you can delineate who the good responders versus the bad responders are. And then hopefully you can try to reprogram these cells, take the ones that would be bad responders and make them good responders. And so this is some work that's being carried out now, um, just characterizing CAR T cells in our in-house CAR T cell model uh, being done, performed now by Charmaine Brown and Caitlin Zevley here. And so we've, We've uh, again teamed up with Steve Gonschlock and Amy Tallur, who Amy has uh, run the first uh, CD19 CAR T cell trial here at St. Jude. And what they've done is they've given us access to the cells of the various stages of manufacturing and infusion and post infusion. And so, and, and we, you know, we don't have the numbers that some of these other centers have, but we got about 15 donors where we can track longitudinally the data or the, the samples and collect data, epi specifically epigenetic data on these. And so working together, Tian, me, Yiping Fan, Caitlin, and Charmaine, what they did was they characterized these, these CAR T cells post-infusion and pre-infusion. So what's happening on the front end of these CAR T cells? Can you use our epigenetic signatures <coughs> to figure out who's going to expand well prior to infusion? And then what happens after infusion? And so what I'm showing you here is first the, 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 the prediction of the expansion. And so what Caitlin and Charmaine and Yiping and Tian did was they profiled the product prior to infusion, and then we got the week one expansion data from the, the Gottschalk lab and, and, and Amy Talur. And what we found was there's a beautiful association between our multipotency index here and the ability of these CAR T cells to expand post-infusion. So they can expand well, but what happens when they're in the patient now? And of course, these are wild type T cells they're gonna undergo terminal differentiation. And so I'm just, we have a lot of cross-sectional data. What I'm just showing you here is our longitudinal analysis. This is the reduction of this multipotency index over time, weeks one, two, three, and four of patients that are treated. So this is showing you that these cells are indeed acquiring these epigenetically repressive programs. What was really interesting about this is now this is getting a little weedy, but we took these, these whole genome methylation profiles and we compared them just back to the normal memory T cell subsets and naive T cells. And what this principal component analysis shows you is that actually this is, this is the trajectory for these, these naive to terminal memory T cells. And the CAR T cells actually look like they're pulling off. They go this way and then they pull off away from the naive T cells. So what's happening? So we took our epigenetic programs and we just compared them these longitudinal programs to various well-established T cell differentiation states. And so what we did here is we looked at the well-defined effector and memory associated signatures defined by Rama, Condi and Rafi and Med's lab uh, a few years back using the yellow fever model system of human vaccination. And what we found was actually 
<clears throat> these CAR T cells really quickly acquire this effector response. Within by week one, they're good effectors. They get into the in, they get into the patients and they kill. But what happens is you progressively lose, and this is a GSA, a gene set enrichment analysis, you progressively lose this memory potential. You have an epigenetic repression of genes that are associated with memory potential. And we did some work with Enrico Luigli where we now have defined exhaustion progenitor cells in humans, and we compared these CAR T cell profiles to these exhaustion progenitor. And indeed, they're acquiring that epigenetic signature. More importantly, well, maybe more importantly, I'm a little biased, I like DNMT3A. More importantly, they acquire these DNMT3A programs over time. So this is not, and we use our preclinical models to define, establish this, this signature, and then we cross-referenced it with our week one, two, and three pro pro programs. So this is not just something that's happening in a preclinical setting. This is happening in real patients. As you pull the cells out, they're becoming epigenetically exhausted. So how do you show that? And so I, you know, I have to be honest here. I was at th this point when we were writing this paper up, I was like, oh, let's just submit the paper. But here it was really where Caitlin Zebley said, no, let's take a look at some of the clinical data. And she really, really simply articulated her question like this. What she said was, well, here's what happens with the CD19 CAR T cells. When you put in uh, the CD19 positive B cells, when you put in the CD19 CAR T cells, B cells go down, CAR T cells go up in number. Now you get to this point in the, in the therapy where the you might have a recurrence of the CD19 positive cells, whether normal B cells or tumor. And what happens to the CAR T cells? Are they exhausted? Do they respond or do they stay just kaput? <clears throat> so she looked at this a couple of different ways in these patients. One, she just looked at and she compared the, the CAR quantity in, in the patient and from the blood at the early versus the peak of the, the initial primary response. And of course it goes up, it goes up significantly. Now we can look at normal B cell reconstitution in these patients and we can ask, okay, if the B cells, the antigens coming back, what happens to the CAR T cells? Do they mount a recall response? The answer was unequivocally no, they do not. And then she looked at it in a different way. So she said, well, we had a couple of patients where they relapse with antigen positive disease. That happens. I know people talk about antigen negative relapse, but actually about 50% of the time it's antigen positive relapse. So we had a couple of patients where we could, they relapse with antigen positive disease and we had an ability to detect and count the CAR T cells. Here's two of those patients. You can see that this is the vector copy number. This is the quantity of the CAR T cells. Primary response goes up, that's great. Comes back down, boom, relapse, no change. So they're not mounting a recall response in this antigen positive relapse, this patient as well. And you re-infuse with a new product and you get this expansion. So the CAR T cells that were there were dysfunctional. So how do you, I'm obviously building to the, the, the mechanism we think it is and how do, you, how do you get around this? So can you use this insight into this epigenetic repression to ge generate a CAR T cell that remains responsive to, to disease and maybe even protects against relapse. And so we, we tried to model this, and this was done by Abor Zhao and Janice Riberty in uh, Stephen Geishlock's group, where they, they put in these, this BLL model of tumor cells, BV173, into the mice. She treated with CD19 CAR T cells, and these are either control, DNMT3, and knockout. And we waited for them to control the DNMT3 and knockout to control the tumor. They challenged these knockout mice, these mice that, that control the tumor, they re-challenged them with antigen positive cells. And what I'm showing you here is that there's a, there's a complete and almost sterile control of these tumors. You see no tumor, tumor growth here. So, and then they took this experiment one step further, they took antigen negative cells and then they re-challenged those mice. And now you see a growth of the, of the, the tumor in those, those cell, in those mice. So the, the DNMT3A knockout CAR T cells were mounting a beautiful recall response, antigen specific and controlling the tumor. So how do you put this all together? Well, we're obviously moving forward here at St. Jude. We're trying to develop a concept for generating these exhaustion resistant CAR T cells. This is being put forward by Becky Epperly, Caitlin Ghidra, uh, Paulina Velasquez, and uh, Amy Talor. Um, but is there any clinical data out there to support this? I know a lot of people get worried that we might be 
playing with an oncogenic driver. It's not actually not an oncogenic driver, but maybe we are. I, you know, there's some concern out there. So is there any additional clinical data to support this as a concept, as, as a clinical trial? And so this, as our paper was coming out, this beautiful paper by Coleman Lindsay, his lab came out to show, or where, rather he was looking at patients that received, received allogeneic transplant after, after disease and specifically patients that had this clonal hematopoiesis, or the donors that had this clonal hematopoiesis driven by DNMT3A. So the, the donor cells were DNMT3A mutations and the, and, and, and the recipients, and uh, they tracked them over time. And so this is the progression-free survival of the patients that did or did not receive DNMT3A clonal hematopoietic stem cells you actually have a better progression-free survival over years when you receive these DNMT3 knockout cells. And in fact, when they treated for GVHD, this, 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 this concern of uh, graft-versus-host disease, they treated by uh, depleting, essentially depleting the T-cells, uh, uh, cyclophosphamide, they lost the efficacy. So these knockout T-cells, presumably T-cells, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating a bit here, uh, protect better, and when you deplete them, you lose that protection. So, and what they concluded was that the donor DNMT3A clonal hematopoiesis is associated with improved recipient survival because of reduced relapse risk. And we've put this all together in a clinical trial concept here at St. Jude. We're really trying to take these concepts of T cell exhaustion and you know, really move this forward to help patients, especially the kids at St. Jude. And I, you know, I, I kind of come back to this, this thing that actually our CEO is saying right now, Dr. Downing, it's one of our core values here is always recognize that advancing treatment for children with catastrophic diseases at the center of everything we do. This is why we exist. It's what we do. We're taking our science now and, you know, we're really trying to move it forward to new therapies. And so this is what I, I want to summarize now what I showed you today, and I'm, I'm going to be open for questions and discussion later. The CAR T cells that we're making, and, you know, I think this has a lot of analogy to uh, responses to checkpoint blockade as well. Our CAR T cells start somewhere around here, week one, two, and three. They end up somewhere here along the exhaustion trajectory, and they become non-responsive. We just kind of showed you this with the PCA of the, the T cells from this uh, the whole genome epigenetic profiling T PCA comparing to memory cells. But we also looked at these TPEX and HIV specific T cells, really showing that they, they track this trajectory. So what I want you to take home from this talk is that, you know, Mary and I and a lot of people in the field are really trying to apply our understandings, the discoveries of T cell differentiation, basic understandings of T cell differentiation and move cellular therapy forward. We're really trying to, now I think the field's really trying to target this sweet spot here, this, this epigenetically poised sweet spot for advancing cellular therapy. We're doing this by gene, edi gene editing, genetic engineering approaches to prevent exhaustion and preserve stemness. But I think there's a lot of approaches out there where you can use these cytokine-driven uh, epigenetic reprogramming or just uh, or metabolism maybe uh, approaches to preserve the T cells at this developmentally plastic state. Um, again, from this seminar, what I want you to take home is that de novo DNA methylation in mouse and human cells limits the efficacy of both ICB and CAR T cell therapy. And I think these CAR T cell studies serve as proof of principle that we can really manipulate these human T cells uh, to enhance the therapy. We've also defined biomarkers uh, that can predict uh, clinical outcome. And we're moving this forward here, hopefully in the near future as a, uh, as a trial to see if we can really pre prevent disease relapse in these patients that have incurable diseases. Um, and thank you for your time. The people that I mentioned along the way are highlighted in red and um, the funding sources are, are abundant and generous, but specifically want to thank St. Jude for supporting our research and Stand Up to Cancer, who's just brought me on as, as, a, as, a, as a member of their epigenetic dream team. And thank you all for listening. We're going to get into our Q&A session. We've got about 10 minutes, I think, before our uh, time together wraps up. Uh, first question will be for Dr. Philip. And I know, Dr. Philip, you did address this in the the one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, kind of chat interface, but that interface is, only, is, is not visible to the general audience. So I just wanted to ask if you could re 
if you could address uh, what factors impact the timing, the differences in timing it takes for a cell to reach uh, terminal exhaustion. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for this is a great question. So, um, you know, the timing, uh, you know, while we think the overall trajectory towards that terminal differentiated state uh, ends up looking pretty similar, whether you look at chronic viral infection or the tumors, kind of how they get there is going to depend on a number of factors. I think uh, one is, you know, uh, within an infection, you've got uh, different uh, probably a different inflammatory pattern. So you have innate signaling, uh, inf different inflammatory cues that might be different than the tumor. That's going to affect how the T cells initially acquire their function or um, or not in the case uh, as we often see in tumors. Uh, secondly, how much antigen is present? So, you know, we, we've seen, you know, chronicity or how much you're getting stimulated sort of depends on how much antigen is around and how often the T cells are getting re-stimmed. Affinity plays a role. So there's a really nice, um, you know, there have been a lot of work on affinity, but um, one of Andrea's graduate students who recently uh, got her doctorate, uh, Moshe Shakiba, had a really nice paper in JX Med that just came out looking at how higher affinity actually more quickly leads T cells to become uh, dysfunctional. Um, so I think those are all potentially factors, probably in tumors, depending on the site and where the T cells are trafficking, like what is the secondary lymphoid organs are going to, or what tissues are they trapping to, that's going to probably also affect, again, how much TCR signaling are they getting and will affect the timing. So I think those are all different, uh, different things and probably others that, uh, that I haven't considered. Thank you very much. Uh, next question for Dr. Youngblood. Is there any information about the any potential off-target effects uh, from knocking out DN, uh, DNMT3A? So, for example, one person asked whether deleting DNMT3A, does that break immune tolerance, immune cell tolerance? I, I, I don't, in the sense that you, you're doing this specifically, or you're doing this in an antigen-specific population, you're not going to generate uh, T cells that are reactive to other epitopes now. So in that sense, you're not going to create this, uh, I don't believe you're going to create this autoimmune cell. Uh, you're not going to, if that's if that's the, the direction of the question. But I do believe you're preventing a tolerization mechanism in these T cells. Exhaustion, I believe, falls under the category of, of tolerance, where you, you chronically stimulate these cells and they be, become repressed. And so we are indeed, for that antigen specificity, preventing that. Thank you very much. Uh, Follow-up question also for Dr. Youngblood. Why do you think that there, are, there were some mice uh, with DNMT3A knockout that still show tumor, uh, tumor progression? Uh, it's actually, so in some of these cases, um, in, in other experiments as well, we got antigen escape. Yeah, so this, so, so that's, that's a, that's a great question. Not all the time, you know, you can, you can, sometimes the tumor can still win. Uh, but a lot of the times when we looked, we saw antigen escape. And so that's why they're, we're trying, we're designing this, this trial as not just CD19, but as CD1922, we're going to tr we, we we recognize that we're going to be providing a selective pressure on this tumor even more so now, and so we probably need to to target two different antigens at, at least. Very good question. Thank you very much, Dr. Youngblood. Uh, Dr. Philip, in your studies, did you notice any? Uh, any spatial distribution data that could potentially impact uh, cellular properties? Um, so, yeah, that's something that we've been looking at more now. Um, the liver model is interesting um, because uh, T cells can actually, you know, unlike maybe some of the sub Q tumor models that a lot of uh, people are familiar with, or probably other solid tumor models where T cells maybe first encounter antigen in the secondary lymphoid organs. Um, T cells can actually see antigen through, there are these fenestrae in uh, hepatic vessels where the T cells can actually directly contact the hepatocytes. So they see antigen in the 
liver as well as in secondary lymphoid organs like, such as the spleen and draining lymph nodes. And so interestingly, the you know kind of the, the timing and the, the patterns of uh, TCF1 expression, for example, we see are different um, in the spleen versus in the liver where the you know, they become very TCF1 negative pretty quickly in the liver. In the spleen, we will sometimes see populations that persist of TCF1 positive. Um, and this is similar to what I think, you know, a lot of the chronic viral infection um, studies, it's important to keep in mind, usually the analysis is almost always being done in the spleen as opposed to the tissue. So some of the differences that we see between those may also be due to where you look at them. Thank you very much. Uh, next question for Dr. Youngblood. In terms of manipulating epigenetics, how often do you have to do it? Does, does adjusting is adjusting epigenetics permanent, or is this something that uh, requires multiple dosages or uh, cellular recycling or something like that? So if if you're so so we obviously did a you know at the end it was a proof of principle we knocked out the enzyme in the cell so that's that's once, right? Um, but if you're going to try to reprogram a cell, that's a great question. We don't know how how often you have to dose uh, with some of these compounds. A lot of people are, I think, well, there are several groups that are now playing with the idea of trying to reprogram T cells uh, using small molecule inhibitors of methyltransferase and histone modif modifying enzymes. Um, but the question is, how, how much do you have to give? How often do you have to give it? We've been doing some of this work now in our lab, and, you know, I don't really have a good answer. I know that we can in vitro erase some of these programs, uh, and that's a really important thing to do because, you know, we, we do these experiments, forget mouse experiments, you know, we do these experiments in just healthy donors uh, and that uh, healthy donor T cells, and that's actually, those T cells don't necessarily resemble what the patient's T cells look like. So you really have to focus in on, I think, what's the challenge in the patient. And then, and, and that is indeed a problem because these T cells in the patients are, tend to be a little more terminally differentiated. Um, uh, they're pre-treated in, 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 in stuff. So you gotta, we got to find ways to erase those, those programs. Uh, and we're working on it, but we don't have uh, it worked out yet. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Youngblood. Unfortunately, it appears that is all the time we have for today. If anyone in the audience has any further questions, please consider reaching out to our speakers directly. Their contact is shown on the screen. As a reminder, this webinar will be archived on the scientists' website, and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand version becomes available for viewing. I just want to close by thanking everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Mary Phillip and Dr. Benjamin Youngblood, as well as our sponsors, Canopy Biosciences, ETCC, Selecta, Acrobiosystems, Adipot Gen Life Sciences, and BD Biosciences. Thank you, everyone, and have a pleasant day.